This video looks at predictive functional control. The chapter is going to assume that the viewer is already familiar with some of the concepts and algebra in the introductory MPC chapters and therefore we're not going to recover those areas and some things we will do very quickly. So for example, we won't talk about models prediction with Karima and state space models. We'll assume you can go to the early videos for that. We won't look at concepts of prediction horizon and control horizon. We won't look at degrees of freedom within the prediction or unbiased prediction. Now all of these things are key for PFC but you can get them in the earlier videos so it's not worth repeating them. So what is predictive functional control? Now most important thing is to note it's probably the most widely used predictive control technique in industry and there's lots of references you can look at. I'm not going to list them. You can pause the video if you want to copy these down. But the key thing here is they're used widely. They're used on a wide range of applications, but often different from your traditional dynamic matrix control. What is PFC then? In terms of this video series, the viewers are going to be interested in questions like how does PFC differ? That's the key word. How does it differ from mainstream predictive control methods such as dynamic matrix control, GPC, and so on? What are the key conceptual differences then? And in therefore, following from that, in which scenarios might PFC be a preferred option and why? So clearly there are differences. There are times when a DMC approach is best and times when maybe a PFC approach is best. We cannot cover every issue in a few brief videos, but what we're going to do is try and cover the most important ones. Basic concepts then. PFC, like other predictive control methods, is based on simple human intuition. So what's the thing? If I can predict the outcome of a given control action, then I should be able to use the prediction in order to select, and this is the key thing, the preferred control action. And if you remember all the videos on GPC, you will see that's exactly what was going on. Practical decision making requires me to use a limited decision space. That is, we want to choose from only a small set of possible control actions because otherwise the decision making just gets too complicated and we can't handle it. So in practice, humans achieve very precise control of the world around us despite using limited decision spaces. And the key thing about PFC is how we limit our decision space within our predictions. So PFC chooses the degrees of freedom to be the coefficients of a polynomial. So we can show that precisely here. This is the future control that PFC uses. So if k is the sample period, the new of k is given by some constant a plus some constant times k plus some constant times k squared. So in other words, it's a parabola. So you can choose your future input sequence to be some form of parabola. Now the decision space or the degrees of freedom that you can therefore choose are A, B and C. Now, key point here, the most common PFC algorithms actually only use the variable A. They only have one decision variable. Variables B and C are provided for scenarios where the target trajectory is a ramp or a parabola. So we'll expand on that here. So the rationale behind the input parameterization. In order to follow a constant target, then asymptotically you're going to need a constant input. And therefore a sensible choice of input is clearly U is a constant for all future samples. And that's all that PFC is doing. It says, look, I need a constant input in the future to meet this target. Let's ask what this constant input should be. If conversely we wanted to follow a target which had a ramp, then the input would also have to be a ramp. And so we would use an input a bit like this, u of k equals a plus bk. Now, 
key objective of PFC, which distinguishes it from other predictive control algorithms, is a focus on the simplicity of the concept and also simplicity of the coding. Now, this is a major distinguishing feature. So, if we can keep everything simple, then it's going to help with our cost effectiveness. So, we can keep the cost down and make it comparable with PID. We can make the implementation much simpler and therefore the computational and coding requirements may also be comparable to something like PID. And finally, by keeping things simple, it makes it a lot easier to give ownership to technical staff. We don't need to hire an expensive consultant to come and do the design for us. We can just give it to one of the main staff that are already there. And tuning can be handled in a more intuitive manner. OK, so this carries on the same theme. What's the rationale behind this parameterization? We want to keep coding, computation and interpretation as simple as possible. And therefore, we want to minimize the number of decision variables and any associated optimization. So a common choice for PFC is to use, and here's the thing, just one degree of freedom because that makes the decision as simple as possible and requires minimal computation. So there it is. All you're doing is choosing a single value of the input and assuming that that input will stay constant in the future. Now, why is that sensible? Let's do a few examples. This example, simple speed control in a car. What's a core component of speed control? So what drivers do is they consider the difference between the current speed and the desired speed. And the key thing is they select a fixed accelerator position they believe will move the speed to the desired one. However, at frequent intervals, what the driver is going to do is update their estimate, as a key word, estimate of the required accelerator position, and thus eventually they're going to remove steady state offset. And you can see that's roughly what humans do, a very simple practice. And critically, the decision variable which the driver is using is of this form. They're choosing a fixed future accelerator position or a fixed future input, which they believe will give the output that they want. And you will see this sort of philosophy matches what PFC is going to do. Here's another example. What if we want to maintain the level of a tank at a desired level? And you can see we've got flow going out and we've got flow coming in. So the user is allowed to change the flow coming in, but they cannot measure the outflow. The outflow is whatever it is. So what do we do? We observe the current depth. So we can mark that down here. We observe what the current depth is there and the desired depth, which could be a little deeper. And then we estimate the required inflow in order to match these. At frequent intervals, what we're going to do is update our estimate of the required inflow. And eventually, therefore, we're going to remove the steady state offset. And what's the key thing again here? You will see the decision variable that we are using is a constant input. We're estimating a constant input and then regularly saying, have I got the right value? So in summary, it's clear that humans use anticipation or a prediction in order to consider the impacts of different control strategies. That's what we do. We choose a strategy that we expect to give the most desirable future outcome. We tend to choose from a restricted set of possible strategies because that manages the complexity of the decision making. So what does PFC do? PFC incorporates many of the key aspects of human behavior. And thus, given that human behavior tends to be quite effective, we would expect PFC to work reasonably well in many cases. Now, there are exceptions, and you can see that human decision making is limited in its efficacy. And so similarly, there's going to be cases where PFC also struggles.